Hello, Jessica. Hey. Hi. That's an incredible setup. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is very big. What is that? Like a monkey? Yeah. Where so I'm... Oh, go ahead. Where did you get that from? Um, my husband actually got him a couple years for me at Walmart. He was like $20. Whoa. He's huge. Yeah, it's crazy. So I'm like sitting on a drum kit right now, and Mervyn yeah. sits on the drums. And we live in a really tiny house, so everything's efficient. And this is, uh, this is my little work area as well. So <laughs> You've got a little Christmas tree on the left there. And my chair is super squeaky, so if it's loud, I'm sorry. It's a squeaky drum stool. Oh, that's so, beautiful. I so it's that. in half, and it hangs on the wall, which is super cool, because it's like doesn't take up any room at all. And a brat's dress? Where do you get something like that? So good. The internet. <laughs> Hot talk. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a little crap top. I say I don't know. Good thing I do have pants on for this. I know some people don't wear pants. <laughs> I got fully dressed. For... You're not like Winnie the Poohing it. Do you yeah, like... no. <laughs> I love that saying where it's like, um, what, what, it's like some kind of like confidence message, but it talks about like Winnie the Pooh walking around in like a crop top and no pants, and it's you know it's like letting his like belly fly, and it's I don't know it's it's inspiring. It's like a little meme, and whenever I see it, I'm always like super inspired. I'm like yeah. Hmm. I've never come across that, but I'm glad you brought that into my life because that's something I really get. I can see that. I think I can learn to love myself now. Yeah, if he can walk around without, you know, with a with a crop top on and no pants, I mean, we can wear whatever we want. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, drum set, have you always been playing drums or is that something new? Um, that's been um, new as of like the last two years. Okay. Um, and definitely uh, with the pandemic stuff, I got into it a lot more. I've oddly enough, I've always wanted to play the drums. That's been like since I was like two or three. Like I've been like, I'm going to be a drummer. I'm going to be a drummer. And like, you know, my parents played bluegrass music and, you mm -hmm. know, they had banjos and mandolins and stuff sitting around. And the closest thing to like any of the music I listened to was a guitar. So I ended up going mm -hmm. guitar because I listened to so much rock music. But you know, now it's, I'm at this point in my life where it's just like, it's still there. And it's just something that, you know, I've always wanted to do. And, and it's, it's really fun too. So it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I do a lot now. Hmm. What pushed you to learn it? Um, well, I think too, just the, um, for me, I'm, I guess, as far as being pushed to do things, I, I do always have this drive of needing to be able to do things on my own mm. and just like proving to myself that I can and not even proving to myself that I can, like just like having that in my mind of like, you can do, you know, like you can do this too. You can learn this, you can do this. And like, even when other people might think, oh, you know, you're not going to, I mean, I feel like already it's, you know, and my husband's very supportive, but he's a really good drummer. And, um, you know, I think with him, he kind of didn't see me, didn't think that I would progress to like the level that I already have as quickly as I have. So it's like, you know, I love to like kind of have those surprises and those kind of like, gotcha, you know what I mean? Like, like, it's, you know, already he'll be like, wow, you can do that. Or you can do that fill or you can do that thing. And it's like, I also loved having that that, you know, um, being able to, you know, prove myself in a sense, you know, if for nothing other than just for fun and to know that I'm like, to, to yeah, it's, it's a good way to push myself, I guess, too. I mean, it's not like I necessarily care what other people think, but I love to, um, you know, I love to surprise people and, you know, get them excited because it gets me excited. Like with the last few records you've put out, Emotional Abandonment, the demo tapes, that was everything was you, right? The yeah. creative concepts, the artwork, which I love so much. Thank you. <laughs> I love the demo tapes. You've got like that little pig in the foreground, the snazzy car. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I feel like with that stuff too, you know, it's really interesting because uh, doing everything myself, you know, the, um, the people that are like core fans of my music and who have been with me for, you know, the duration of my entire career, they love it. And this is for mm -hmm. them and they, and cause they, they like me and they like my ideas. And 
And I feel like, you know, the times that I've worked with other people or I've been with labels who have kind of pushed me to be more um, palatable and, you know, less weird and less, you know, like, um, you know, less of a punk. And, and, and like, when I've done that, it's been, um, it's, it's been almost polarizing in a sense that, you know, my true fan base, they're supportive of me, but they're also kind of like, where's Jessica? Right. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is a watered down Jessica. And then I get new people, but then they are weirded out by the, you know, by the side of me that is, you know, a rebel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely for me, it's like, I don't necessarily want, like, I would much rather stay true to myself. You know, I'd rather be a, like a Daniel Johnston, you know what I mean? Like I don't have the desire to be, you know, Taylor Swift or something. So it's mm -hmm. always weird when I'm working with like, someone else and they're trying to like put me in this box and I'm like I don't think you get it yeah <laughs> like this is art to me mm. so what did happen after you released Sorry Is Gone because that's the last record where you know you had a team of sorts that was that was a really interesting time for me because I felt like a lot of people including the team a lot of people latched on to me mm. and uh, and it was and it, it was really fake, but I, I didn't know that. So I thought I was making all these friends and all these. And I had this team of females. I had I had um, a, a female manager. I had, you know, a female tour manager, a female band. And I was like, oh, I'm making it. And, and so, too, I've never really had any female friends. You know, I didn't I didn't go to public school. I am on the autism spectrum. It's hard for me to to make friends with females. So I was stoked i was like oh i have all these women surrounding me and it was so fake and it, it was it was it was devastating because i i when when i realized it it was just like oh you only want to get something from me and and it was it was devastating it was just devastating when i kind of realized that these people were just kissing my ass you know and they weren't actually like confidants or our, our girlfriends and you know and I and I do and I have friends you know I have a very small group of friends that that are actual friends so it's, it's you know to kind of realize to be able to compare the two I think it was it was weird it was it was inflating at first I was so excited I had all these people backing me and then I just couldn't I just couldn't handle the um God, I don't even know how, how you would describe it I just couldn't yeah I guess the the fakeness, the unrealness, the, you know, people being germy and, and the, the networking and the, like, it was just something that I couldn't handle and I didn't want to. And it just, and I've, and I guess that's always kind of happened with me. And um, I mean, with the first label that I was with, they kept kind of pushing me into this narrative and, and it was just, and it was kind of like, okay, you know, my publicist was like, you can't say this in interviews, you can't do that, you can't, don't talk about this, don't talk about that. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I'm, am I just supposed to be like a, a blank whiteboard? Like, you know, there's a reason that people listen to my music because they like what I have to say. So, like, don't tell me what to say or how to act or how to be, you know? How did you come to that realization that, um, as you said, like this female team was just kind of fake and just kissing your ass well I think you know because it's like female empowerment was really trendy during the time that sorry it's gone came yeah. out uh -huh. and um you know there was the me too movement and and everybody was like oh I'm behind this and blah 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 and um when I experienced you know and and this is not the most fun thing to talk about but when my dogs were murdered um, and I was ex actively experiencing domestic violence. No one in, in this crew, they all just radio silence. And one of my, so the, um, she worked with ATO. She doesn't anymore, but like the artist management person for ATO, my abuser had went to her and, and talked like, I don't know if you're aware of this, but when like someone is like an abusive male, will go and they will try to trash talk the victim to everyone they know so that way when the victim tries to speak out they he's tried to make her look bad and this is you know 
something you read on the internet and domestic violence support groups, every woman had the same experience. You know, they try to turn everyone against you. So he, I got to take a breath. (laughs) He had went to her and said all of this stuff. And what he said to her, long story short, was incriminating to him. And what he said to her actually ended up being proof that he killed my dogs because he said the same thing to several other people. And then he said the same thing. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a long story, but because it was a big convoluted thing, but he said something to her that was key. And, and the thing he said to her, all I needed her to do was to write a statement to give to me from my lawyer. Just a statement from her saying, this is what he said to me. And she wouldn't do it. And I just, you know, I'm thinking, okay, all these people are pretending to be supportive. They're pretending to be supportive. But when someone you know, who is supposedly your friend, is actually experiencing domestic violence, and you're in the middle of it, and you're involved, you say, oh, that's not... I don't want to be involved in that. I don't, I don't want to get, you know, she was very much like, I just don't need this in my life right now. Mm-hmm. And I just remember thinking that she was like, I have a lot going. She literally said, I have a lot going on. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking all you have to do, I mean, it would have taken you less than five minutes. And I could have actually had this person arrested for this, but no, this person just gets to go and live their life. Mm-hmm. You know, but and, and you have proof he said something to you that was so absurd that you could have gotten in, you know, we could have gotten him in trouble. We could have got him, mm-hmm. you know, and I just I couldn't imagine being the type of person, you know, and then in the same thing, my female manager, she was like, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved. And it's like, well, you're involved. Mm-hmm. If this guy spoke to you, you're involved now. And all you have to do is just say, write a statement so I can give it to my lawyer. And I can take this to court. And so I think, you know, these people, it just, you know, and it bums me out too, because, you know, it, the same thing, like the record label that I was with, they were donating money to a domestic violence shelter and doing all this stuff. And it's just like, but when it comes down to just, you know, being a human being, you're just a bystander. Right. You're just going to stand there and do nothing. And, and that's, and I couldn't imagine, you know, if, if, if someone came to me and said something about you and I said, well, that's weird. You know, I, you know what I mean? Like I would talk, I would talk to you about it. I would do anything you needed, you know, because it, you know, we women need to stick together. So I think it, it, for me, it was when that happened, you know, and I don't necessarily blame, I'm in a sense, I'm, I'm glad that everyone showed their true colors. Mm. These situations that you're put through, it means that you constantly have to see people's true colors. Yeah. And it's not, you know, and that's the thing, of course, I wish it never happened. Yeah. You know, um, at the same time, it really, you know, and, and my now husband too, we were dating then. And so he ended up losing a lot of friends in the process as well. And, and one of his best friends is actually friends with the, with my ex abuser now and he stopped being and it was really it was bizarre how people just said you know because it's easier to believe that somebody isn't a bad person or that people can't do that stuff than it is to believe the person who has proof Mm. it's easier than it is to believe the person who you know even and even if you don't and that's the thing you know because one of our friends was like I need to see like everything you have and I'm like okay I have like a book of printed out text messages and all this stuff and blah and then you know And I told my husband, I said, we don't have to do this. Like, this isn't fair. This isn't right. Like, we shouldn't be having to, like, go through all this documentation with people to get them to, like, trust us and believe us, you know, because it's more likely that that this is happening than it's not, you know? (laughs) That's the thing, too. Like, like in abusive situations, people want to believe that people couldn't do that to someone. But in reality, that's... People don't lie about that. This isn't pleasant for me to talk about, you know? I mean, this isn't, this isn't fun. This isn't something that I would, I don't understand why anyone would think that anyone would, would be dishonest about something like this because, you know, I feel like I want to throw up when I talk about it. You know, I, I wish that I could 
delete it all from my life, you know? And sometimes I, I, I think I do, you know, I, sometimes I think I want to, but I, you know, I think maybe I'll go on Instagram and I'll delete all the stuff where I've, I've told everyone, you know, and I can just start fresh and start new. But, but if I do that, then I'm not only protecting the person that hurt me, but I'm possibly putting other people in danger because by, by removing that awareness of dangerous people and, and, you know, and, and, and here's a dangerous person. This is what they did to me. Be careful because I posted a thing on Instagram with the dude's name and he was following hundreds of my fans and liking and commenting on their posts and pictures about me. Yeah. I got an email too. Fuck dude. Yeah. Oh my God. What, what kind of email did you get? I sent it to you. It was a long time ago. Oh, okay. I'm sure it was probably the exact same thing. It was the, yeah. so basically, and I don't know, did I tell you the situation in the email? A little bit, a little bit. So basically he had put antifreeze, he threw antifreeze soaked meat over the fence of my boyfriend's backyard, who's now my husband. <laughs> and um, then he called the cops and he described my now husband and said, there's a man covered in tattoos, pouring antifreeze in a water bowl. And there was a fence and you couldn't see into the backyard. So he was obviously, you know, he was trying to frame my boyfriend so I would leave him. Mm -hmm. And then he was saying, and he's a crazy drug addict, like, and she's crazy and on drugs and all this stuff. And it was, and what was really weird about that is like, I really had my shit together, <laughs> you know? So it was, it also hurt because like, I, you know, it's like there have been times in the past where I've been off the rails. So that wasn't unbelievable to people, but it really hurt because I, I, you know, really had my shit together <laughs> and I, and, and I, and I wanted people to know that. So it was, it was devastating in that sense. And, um, and so that, because he said that on the phone to the police, all I needed was other people's accounts of him saying, and he phrased it to, to the, the ATO woman, he phrased it the exact same way in person to her that he did on the phone to the police. So it's like we have the, we have the written account of what he said, and it's word for word. Mm-hmm. You know, and even the police were like, yeah, this is obviously like some jealous ex or something Like they didn't for a second think it was my boyfriend. They were like, oh, my God, we're so sorry. This person's obviously, you know, it's like obvious. Mm -hmm. So and that's the thing. And he was emailing every person that he could, people from radio stations and all this crazy. And, and so, you know, for me, it's like not fun to talk about. But at the same time, people, you know, if one thing can if one good thing can come from me talking about it and if one person can, can go, yeah, I've been through something similar or yeah, I've had, and I've had people message me about their smear campaigns and about, you know, losing fr friends and, you know, they're like my, I don't talk to any of my family anymore. Mm. You know, it's like, I don't, and that's, that's different, but my mom sided with my ex-husband because my dad is abusive to my mom and so my mom said well you shouldn't leave your husband just because he's abusive like you're supposed to work through this and i'm like oh my fucking god you know what i mean like i so it's been a weird it's a lot you know it's, it's saying a lot but uh it's been a really intense few years since mm -hmm. sorry is gone came out because when i spoke out publicly about domestic violence, like I said, it was trendy, everybody was on board, and then because I was still experiencing ongoing domestic violence, people backed off really quickly because at the end of the day, they're not actually there to help. Mm -hmm. No one actually wants to help you. Mm. I feel like, um, like you said, empowerment is trendy because when I think of empowerment, I think of a person leaving this abusive relationship and it's like oh she's over it now we don't have to think about it anymore mm -hmm. on sorry is gone you have lyrics like i tried to leave i couldn't 
and it's shit like that people don't want to hear people just want to you to have overcome it they don't want to experience your actual pain they don't they don't want it in their lives and it's fucking bullshit it's absolutely bullshit and and i think too you know it's and that's another interesting point is when i tried to leave my ex-husband, you know, first, second, third time, I would go and I, I would stay with this friend of mine. And, you know, they, they say on average, it takes seven times before somebody leaves, mm -hmm. you know, actually is able to leave and you have to go back. And yeah, I, I need to go back for financial reasons are, you know, my ex-husband was in my house and so I wanted to go home and he wouldn't leave. And I ended up actually just having to give him my house. Mm -hmm. uh, because he, I was like, oh, you know what? I don't want to fight you over this. Like, mm -hmm. if you take this, you'll feel like you won. And I can just move on. And you're not going to try to continue to, to get things from me. Because all that relationship with him was about was what could he get from me? And I was his, his sugar mama. And, you know, he was just like a, like a little, you know, it was, it was like a, like a, like a slutty girl, but it was a dude. And like, I was, you know, it was just like, I could, his wheels were always like, what can I get from you? You know, like, what kind of, like, what can you buy? I was always having to buy him stuff. And it was, it was insane. It was, it was, it was atrocious. And I was like, I was 22 when I married him and I was, you know, a total redneck and, and I, and I just, and, and, socially awkward and I had no idea what was right and what wasn't right. And I can look back on that now and go, that was freaking insane. Mm -hmm. But when I tried to, uh, I'll go back to, I got sidetracked. When I tried to leave about the third or fourth time that I went to go stay with this friend, she was over it. Yeah. She was like, okay, I, I'm not going to like help you anymore. And then by the time that I did leave him, I had no one, none. I had no support group. None of the people that, and, and mind you, these same people were telling me, oh, you got to leave him. If you ever want to leave him, I'll help you. Let me know. I'll loan you some money. You can come stay at my place. Anything you need. And then when I finally left him, boop, fuck, radio silence. Yeah. So that's why I think people need to know this, too. People need to know that, like, yeah, it's not just you leave and everything's okay. And, you know, and people need to know that, like, I think people are horrible at being supportive, you know, when it comes to this kind of stuff because they don't know how to. Mm -hmm. So people need to under, understand like where women are coming from in these situations. Have you ever been in a situation where you've had to support another woman? I, I feel like not. It's interesting because in situations where I've, I mean, with family members where I've tried, I've been like kind of ostracized and rejected. You know, I have fortunately had the opportunity to talk with a lot of women online. And that's been, that's been kind of amazing because people feel comfortable enough to reach out to me. And I actually feel like I can give them, you know, and I don't, I don't and, and I'll, you know, here's a disclaimer. I'm not, I'm not a therapist. I'm not like a licensed anything, you know, I don't necessarily recommend my advice. Um, but if, you know, I, I do feel like I have, lived it you know so i have real advice as far as like i'm not going to tell you to call the police and go to a homeless shelter or, you know what i mean like i'm not going to tell you to like calling the police doesn't do anything mm -hmm. you know so that you know what calling the police does it, it pisses off the person that just beat your ass mm -hmm. and makes things worse for you when they get out two to three days later so it's like what is that you know that's the, like there's nothing until you know, until domestic violence is taken seriously in the legal system, then then it's not it's not there to help us. Mm. Is, is there really a way for um, people like that to get justice? Like, would would jail be justice? I I mean, I think it would. I think you know, and then I, I go through this a lot because a lot of people. You know, it's hard for me to think about, you know, people who have hurt me, mm -hmm. you know, hurting other people and going about their lives and looking for their next victim and doing whatever they want. And, and, but I have to remember that like the biggest punishment of all is being that person, mm -hmm. living in that person's body and being the person who does those things and who, 
you know, you have to live with everything you've ever done if you're that kind of person. And I know that like, I can live with everything that I've ever done. But, you know, these people, in order to be the kind of person that does these things, you're, you're very, you know, you're mentally unstable, you're mentally ill, it's very difficult to be you. And, and these people, you know, they have to look at themselves in the mirror every day. Yeah. Did your, did your label drop you after you released Sorry Is Gone? Did they just let go of all that support? Mm, they didn't drop me. Um, they they offered to keep me, but they made an offensively low offer for my next record. Right. <laughs> and like it was it was crazy because I, it was like, um, and I, I'm trying to think. I mean, I feel like it was like forty five thousand dollars for the for Sorry Is Gone, and then it was like five grand for the next one. Oh my god! <laughs> and that was after like I had to email. I couldn't get anyone from ATO to write me back. And I had one person send me an email saying, oh, I can't wait to hear your new songs. Mm -hmm. And then eight months later, I'm like, here's my new songs. And like, no one will get back to me. And I'm thinking, and then he made that offer. And what's hilarious is I've made like, just on the tape demos alone, I've made like, you know, way more mm -hmm. than, than five grand. <laughs> you know, it's just like literally just like releasing my cassette demos, yeah. you know, like, and, 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 and it's, you know, it's offensive because I'm like, look, if that's what you're, you know, going to offer me, then I'm just going to do this myself and actually make money because I don't, you know, it's not a, a status. People think that, and that's the thing, you know, I don't have a, a hatred for record labels or anything like that. And ATO was cool and they did a lot of stuff for me, um, you know, and I, I enjoyed working with them at the same time, you know, they were, they're a really big label and they kind of try to mass themselves as, as an indie label, but they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of artists. And when you've got like my morning jacket and the Alabama shakes and all these people that make millions of dollars, you know, your actual indie artist doesn't is invisible and doesn't matter, you know? And, and he told, and this is the funniest thing. So I, I finally, I, I posted that thing on my Instagram where I was like, you know, I can't get ATO to, uh, answer my emails or my phone calls, right? And then a bunch of my fans started messaging ATO on Instagram. And within an hour, uh, the head of ATO emailed me and said, call off your army. Like, you got me. Wait, let's talk. You know? <laughs> so I recorded our entire conversation because I was like, whatever this fool is. <laughs> no, he's not a fool. He's a sweet guy. But I was like, whatever this guy is about to say, like, I need to make sure that I, I have this down. And he goes... Well, I mean, you've only sold 30,000 copies of Sorry is Gone. So, I mean, it didn't do very well. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, this is the most I, I've ever sold of anything I've ever done. I never thought in my life I would hear the words only yeah. before the number 30,000 because he's saying that and I'm sitting there going, 30,000 fucking copies. <laughs> You know, and that was, you know, and, 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 you know, now it's obviously been more because more years have gone by, but like when he, I was just thinking, you know, and that's when it, it dawned on me that like, this isn't, you know, that that's not really my scene, you know? And I think, and that's not to say I love doing everything myself. It's not to say I wouldn't work with, with another label if it felt right. But at the same time, I've learned so much from the labels that I've worked with that I don't really see what they could do mm. differently than what I could do. Mm. So, you know? you're, yeah, you're on Patreon, you've got Bandcamp. Has that been good to you? Yeah, yeah, Bandcamp's been really cool. Um, you know, it's kind of, um, it's, been, it's been a surprise to me um, is just how much you know how much i've been able to make you know not just off of you know music but off of drawings and, and art and things that i anything I, I kind of decide to put up any piece of me that i decide to put up you know people are supportive of that and it's you know it, it's also really brought me closer 
to to my fans and they you know they'll message me through Bandcamp and we'll talk about stuff and you know I'll make custom things if somebody asks and like somebody just asked me to make like a custom Christmas present for their dad mm. and, and I can't say what it is but um just JIC um but um <laughs> you know and I love that kind of stuff you know and that kind of stuff never would have happened if I had like a manager mm. and you know a label and all the in a public like you know all these people like kind of in between mm -hmm me and and my my fans who are you know like my my people and your newer stuff's not on spotify either no and i might put it up eventually um i you know i think right now i want to give i've decided because i um so I'm doing all of these you know i'm i'm doing 5 7 inches mm -hmm. and they're all going to make one whole album and mm -hmm. so i'm thinking after each one has been out for a little bit, but I'll put them on Spotify, but I don't want to encourage people to just go on Spotify and listen. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, I, I do, I mean, I am doing everything myself. I need the support. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I guess I said, that's just it. This is, I can't tour. I had two months of tour dates canceled, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that like, because yeah, I had a bunch of stuff canceled because of COVID. And, you know, I think that, you know, yeah, I think for me, it's just, uh, it's, it's not, we should, we as artists shouldn't be ashamed to ask for, mm. for compensation for what we create. For, for me as a fan of your music, it's been, it's felt like a really nice way to bond with your music. Um, just to really, instead of just streaming music, like to really, you know, pay what I want, have this in my collection. It, it feels way more personal and, yeah, I, I love, I, I've been listening to Emotional Abandonment a lot. Um, Daddy Boyfriend makes me laugh. It makes me feel a lot of things. Um, it's got some of the greatest lyrics. My daddy is my boyfriend. I'm free to call it what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Very thank good. You. And that's the, per you know, it's great to hear you say that because that is the purpose of, of the way that I'm releasing this, you know, is to is to make it personal yeah. you know between me and and my listeners and to make it something that that we share you know and here in and, and you know the vinyls they're these limited edition collector's items you know i'm only making 500 of them and once they're gone they're gone and that's something that you have that like you know that, that that's a little piece of me that you get to have and it's not some big thing that you know is mass produced and all the, you know it's like it's not and it's and here's you know and i could go through the all you know, it's a thing like I, when I, that's the other thing, because I know how, how everything works. It's like, I can go through. And as I was doing it, I was like going through the normal steps of releasing an album. And I was like, screw this. Mm -hmm. like, like, why would I try to do things normally when I myself am not normal? Mm -hmm. You know, like, what am I trying to do? Why would I try to do, you know, a release in the sense of like you know okay and then yeah i'll have to i'll call record stores and get it in in record stores and you know and sign up for whatever and have them put it on itunes and all that stuff and it's like you know i i just don't i don't necessarily i've never really viewed music that way and it's been weird for me because i've been doing this for so long and when i was 17 is when i got my first manager and and i feel like i've always been kind of just like corralled into these different mm -hmm. avenues that i didn't necessarily want to go so mm -hmm. as a 31 year old who's finally able to just go here here it is mm -hmm. you know it has not been you know as my husband says like nobody else has had their hands in it you know it's like it's like he's like people always just want to put their hands in your stuff and mm -hmm. like to hear you without other people's hands in your stuff is, you know, it's, it's refreshing. Mm. What did you use to record all these songs? Like the vocal effects on emotional abandonment are obviously crazy and great. <laughs> well, so I used, I used Logic mm -hmm. uh, and a MacBook. And for these songs, I used $12 microphones off of Amazon, but now I have nice adult microphones. I bought real ones, but my, um, 
I, I mean, the stuff sounded, it sounded good, but it definitely sounded really lo-fi. And I did have a friend of mine in St. Louis mix mm. the tracks and he is just, he has a badass studio and is like a magician. So he ran things through stuff that he has at his studio. And it's, what's cool about that is that, you know, he just kind of, he would take a vocal and run it through something else or take my guitar and run it through another amp and, mm. and, and it, we'd go back and forth and he'd ask what I liked and what I didn't like. And, and that was cool because I was able to, to do everything at home. And then that was the only other person that I had do anything. And, and honestly though, he's like, I think like I told, I told a friend of mine who I was, I got him to mix an album for a friend. And I told her, I said, if I had a baby, I would give him my baby and that baby would come back better. <laughs> like if I had a real human baby, I'd be like, take this and give it back to me better. <laughs> Is it, um, is your present life influencing these songs? Um, like your life there? Oh, your definitely. Husband? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, my husband is my daddy. <laughs> um, <laughs> he is, he's, um, he is 10 years older than me and, you know, gray oh. and <laughs> very Papa-like. And so oh, I think, you, nice. know, you know, and that's the thing too, I think coming to terms, you know, with, with the healthy aspect of, of daddy issues and, you know, and, and making that not a shameful thing, you know, mm -hmm. making, making that more of like a, yeah, like there's nothing, you know, like there's nothing wrong with having positive male role models in your life or having, po especially if you've had, a, if you've had a history of bad experiences with men, there's nothing wrong with finding that in your adulthood I love that so much and it's I don't think I've ever heard that in music before the yes I don't I hadn't either you know so I when I wrote that I wrote that song and then I and I wrote I wrote like half of it in a hot tub like acapella and I was like this is ridiculous and you know, I'm just in there like my daddy is my boy and I'm like, this is so good insane and um and then I kind of let it go because I was like, I can't, you know, sing that. <laughs> then I came back to it months later and it, it, it never left my head. Yeah. And it's had a stuck in my head and I was like, okay, I need to release this. And throughout the history of my songwriting, whenever the voice goes through my head that says, you can't say that, mm. that's exactly the songs that, that I need to, that other people need to hear and that mm. I need to release. Mm. So I feel like with most of my songs, it started with a, uh, you know, but it's like, I mean, that's what people, people, you know, have been connecting with since I was a teenager is just what's in my mind and in my heart, you know, just what I'm thinking, what's, what's, what's going on with me. You know, it's always been very, you know, journal esque. Mm. Love that. How about, how about the title track? Yeah. Emotional abandonment. That one is, um, that's an interesting one too, because especially with everything that happened to me, as far as like friends and family, it was, that one was kind of written out of, out of a moment of like grief and anger because it was just like, okay, you know, this is, and I, I think it, I, I was able to pin, you know, put a, I was able to put a pin on it, you know, and, and I, cause I was just, I couldn't figure out what it was. And I was like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And like one day I was just driving and I was like, oh, I've been like emotionally abandoned and like, you know, <laughs> it's like, and, and I kind of thought it was fun to, you know, and there's, and the song is about several different people specifically, you know, so it's kind of all mixed up as far as like, you know, different people that I've worked with and been friends with. And, and, and I thought it was interesting instead of, you know, going with the, it, like almost like a positive negative, like being like, well, you're really good at, like, you're good at, at, you know, doing this and doing that. Like you're good at, you know, getting my hopes up. You're good at like, you know, you're good at emotionally abandoning me because I think like, instead of saying like, you know, this is what you did, this is what you did, this is what you did, you know? And yeah. And I'm trying to think of how, I think that started too, because one of the guys in the song is one of those people who like needs to be good at everything mm. and is like, you know, okay, like I'm the best at this. I'm the best at that. And you know how like, especially men can be that like almost competitive, 
mm-hmm. in a sense. So that was when I was like, okay, you know what else you're good at? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, will you be releasing any songs anytime soon, like a Christmas song maybe? I've been working on one. Okay, I've been working good. Good on one. Good to know. <laughs> so this will be the fourth year in a row. So I'm working on an original Christmas song, and then there's a possibility of a, a Christmas collaboration with someone else as well. But for for now, yes, I I don't want to break my Christmas streak. Okay. And then um, three months from when the first one came out is when I'm hoping to have the second uh, seven inch out as well. Cool. Yeah. Will it just be you and your husband for Christmas this year? Um, we are actually, we're going to visit his parents, but we're going to do it in a, um, you know, distancey way (laughs) and, um, just so it'll just be the four of us, which will be nice, but we get, we're going to go up there and just kind of, you know, sit outside and (laughs) visit and say hi. And it'll actually be my first, uh, Christmas with my husband's parents. So that'll be cool. So I've kind of, cause the last one we did, I think the last two we did on our own. Mm. And so, you know, I think it'll be, especially with everything that's been going on, you know, like we're kind of making an effort to like safely visit mm. because we, I think we really need it. Mm. Will they have like a vegan turkey? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they will have something for us. Um, if not, we'll bring something. They've been really sweet. Um, they, the last time I saw them, they made vegan pizza. So they're, oh, nice. they're sweet about that. But yeah, you know, I'm vegan. <laughs> you, yeah, I mean, the, the food you post actually looks pretty amazing. I, yeah, yeah, because we're on different time schedules. I'm like, oh, I don't want to be hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies I'm always hungry I'm always I all I want to do is eat I swear like I in, in my favorite food category is deep fried and I am just uh yeah I the amount of time that I spent like I would be so embarrassed for anyone to know the amount of time I spend thinking about food <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your favorite like your ultimate dinner oh um well, that's a tough one because, you know, it changes a lot. I really, I mean, I love pizza. I love, so recently I was looking, so for a couple months, I've been looking for like a vegan, like cheesy bread, like the kind you get at a pizza place, mm-hmm. you know, that's just like pizza dough with like cheese, but like, I, I just, doing it at home is just not the same, mm. you know? And this pizza place near us finally got vegan cheese and I ordered their cheesy bread and I was like crying. It was so good. I was just like, I was like, Oh God, cheesy bread, you know? So I'm very, you know, as far as that goes, I'm not super fancy. Even when I wasn't a vegan, I was very much like, you know, like trashy foods, like like corn dogs and, you know, stuff like that. So I would say I still like anything with melty cheese on it, but now it's just vegan cheese. Nice. Well, I think that's an excellent way to end this. <laughs> yes. I'm going to go make lunch. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm going to have a snack. <laughs> Definitely. Well, it's so good to see you. Thank you for talking it's with so me. It's so good seeing you come to England. When... Yeah, so when all this is over, I yeah. know you guys are going to get vaccined sooner. You need to come here. <laughs> We're getting vaccined, like, right now. So, Like someone's got, like, a shot in your arm, like, off the camera? <laughs> yeah, maybe just behind my back. Like, don't say anything. How do you feel about the vaccine? Real, real quick before you go. I'm just curious. Um, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> okay. I love people's opinions on vaccines because it's you know I'm all, everybody's always so so different. You know, people I, are like, no way would I ever. Or like, yeah, give it to me. Or <laughs> oh, give me the. I don't care. Yeah, get it in. Yeah, I mean, the things that we, it's just, so, somebody posted this funny thing, too, and I was, and they were saying, like, they were talking about people, like, you know, doing, like, cocaine in a bar, and those are the same people that say, like, oh, I feel suspicious about the vaccine, and it's like, you don't know where that crap came from, you know, and I just feel like, yeah, especially, you know, to go back to food, the things that I eat, and the things that, you know, <laughs> The, the makeup I put on my face, you know, I don't know what's in anything, you know what I mean? Like, so it's like to, I think to have a little bit of faith, it's better to try the vaccine and hope that it works, you know, we'll but see. you know, 
if all of the British people and all the everybody who gets theirs first, if they start growing like six toes and everything, then then we'll know. <laughs> maybe, not, maybe not. Yeah, I'm glad that they're testing it on the Brits. I feel I feel like we deserve it. <laughs> oh my god. Well, I hope that you keep all your fingers and toes and don't grow any extras. Yeah, I'll let you know. I wouldn't mind an extra thumb. Maybe that could be useful. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah, that would be very cool. I'd, I'd be so good at guitar. <laughs> I love that. That's really yeah. fun. Well, <laughs> thank okay. you so much for talking to me. Yeah, it thank you. you. I appreciate it. Please enjoy your lunch and hopefully talk to you soon. And yeah, thank you. Yes, so anytime. Much. Anytime. All right. Bye, Jessica. Bye. Take care. Bye. You too.